Fox 61, Connecticut's news station, starts with a weather impact alert. Good evening and thanks for joining us for the Fox 61 News at 6. I'm Brent Harden. And I'm Bridget Biorla. More storms rolling into Connecticut impacting your night. Yeah, let's send it right over to uh, meteorologist Ryan Breton with what you need to know. Uh, Ryan, uh, some fireworks coming through the state right now. Absolutely, Brent and Bridget. Good evening to you. Good evening, everyone. A severe thunderstorm watch remains in effect for all of the state until 8 o'clock tonight. Looking at the live radar right now, we really have two clusters of storms. One that's right on the Massachusetts border up into central Mass. This is probably been the most severe area then another cluster that went through Fairfield County and now is hitting New Haven in between there isn't too much but there are still some storms back to the west so we've got a chance for showers and thunderstorms through the evening even though the watch only goes until 8 o'clock there may be a couple of more shortly after that here's a look at the storm going right off New Haven a ton of thunder and lightning right over West Haven and New Haven right now not a severe storm but you can certainly see uh, the lightning there at the mouth of the river and now crossing over the river into East Haven in Hartford, we do have some rain falling up and down the 91 corridor, Windsor, uh, Windsor Locks, and then all the way down toward Meriden as well. We have some rain at this point. Another thunderstorm soaking the northwest corner. This around Heartland and Norfolk. Not severe, but there could be some wind gusts to 30 or 40 miles per hour with this storm as it comes through. Eastern Connecticut, you haven't had much yet. The sun is still out, but these showers and thunderstorms are heading your way. So you've got a chance to see a bit more action here over the next couple of hours. Now, once we get past to 9 or 10 o'clock. The severe weather risk will be low, but there may still be a couple of storms through about midnight. And then by tomorrow morning, it's a humid start, but a dry finish. We'll talk about the big change on the way coming up in about 10 minutes. Back to you. Ryan, thank you. The search for two missing swimmers at Candlewood Lake in Danbury is suspended for the night. Crews have been searching for two men who reportedly jumped off a boat near an area known as City Island Monday and haven't been seen since. The search is set to resume at 7 tomorrow morning. New at 6, state police are investigating after a DOT truck was hit on I-91 in New Haven. Police say this happened in the area of exit 9. The right lane was closed for some time. Police say two people were injured. The extent of their injury is still unknown tonight. We will bring you the latest information as soon as it comes into our newsroom. It's been 24 hours since the folks living in tiny structures in the back of a New Haven neighborhood were told they needed to pack their things and go. This as city and state leaders say their temporary permits to keep the lights on ran out. But as Fox 61's Julia LeBlanc reports, those in the Rosette Village aren't going down without a fight. We have our own fire extinguisher. Every unit has one, you know, fuse box panel for electricity and stuff. Joel Nieves moved into this tiny structure in the backyard of the Amistad on Rosette Street three weeks ago. After being homeless, it's the first time he's been able to sleep in an air-conditioned room and use his CPAP machine in a while. I feel safer here than I've, I've been in months. This to me is more humane than most campgrounds in the state of Connecticut. But soon the cool air that helps him sleep may go away. It's a tough situation, but people really have to abide by the rules. The six structures were built and brought here last October. At the time, there was a back and forth between the city and those living here, since the structures were not zoned properly and weren't up to state building code. The city worked with them to resolve the zoning issues, and the state gave them a temporary 180-day permit to get through the winter. But now that temporary permit is up. The state makes those rules, the city is required to enforce them. And so the city has noticed them that they need to remove the structures, vacate the structures, and, um, uh, and we've noticed the ut utility that they need to turn off the power. The State Department overlooking those laws says, quote, these structures do not meet the structural strength thresholds for wind and snow loads, foundation requirements, energy efficiency requirements for thermal insulation, fire resistance rated walls, and sanitary provisions. The city keeps saying, my hands are tied. We can't think outside of this box. There's no category for this, okay? So instead of admitting that, what they say is, these things are unsafe. And once again, the only thing that can make these things unsafe is if you turn the power off. Mark Colville, who owns the land the structures sit on, wants the city and the state to work with them to keep the electricity on. The mayor has the power to do this. This is exactly the same dynamic being repeated again 180 days later. The state is the one that approves the building code, state building code, and uh, I don't have control over that. I can't just snap my fingers and change state law. 
Now the mayor tells us that even though they were told to take the structures down here, the city doesn't plan on coming onto the property and forcing them to do so. He does say, however, they plan to put a lien on the property. We are in New Haven. Julia LeBlanc, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. All right, Julia, thank you. The site of an old elementary school in East Hartford is about to be transformed into a new housing development. It was once called the McCartan Elementary School, but hasn't been used for classrooms in decades. In recent years, the building served as a senior center and a YMCA, but it is about to be torn down to make room for up to 25 new homes for families in the East Hartford area. It's a project made possible thanks to $4.5 million in funding that that's recently approved by the state bond commission. There is always a lot of competition for uh, state dollars. And I think one of the reasons that this uh, project rose to the top is because it accomplishes many goals. Uh, one, to take a blighted property and put it back to a productive use and also to provide much needed uh, affordable housing. The money will pay for the demolition of the building and infrastructure improvements like a new sewer system. City planners hope to knock it down by the end of the year, but it's still unclear tonight when construction will begin on the new housing project. State leaders announcing a new bill to help local farmers when disasters strike, like uh, floods ruining their crops. In fact, the Save Our Small Farms Act comes in the wake of devastating flooding last July. The goal of the legislation is to lower the cost of purchasing coverage, reduce the amount of paperwork to simplify the process, and double payouts from $300 to $600,000. The bill also requires the farm agency to improve data collection at the county level for accurate payouts and encourage farmers to invest in a true insurance policy with the Whole Farm Revenue Protection Program. An important day at the North Branford Police Department, a ribbon-cutting ceremony held this morning for the department's new location across the street from the old building on Forest Road. Construction on the more than $16 million facility began last year, and coming up in about a half an hour, the department will host the official swearing-in of Chief James Lovelace and Deputy Chief Michael Pendleton. The shift comes after Chief Kevin Halloran announced his retirement back in December. And new tonight, a fallen trooper continues to be honored. Trooper First Class Aaron Pelletier's name was engraved into the Connecticut Law Enforcement Memorial at the Training Academy in Meriden today. He will officially be honored on the National Peace Officers Memorial Day next May. Trooper Pelletier was hit and killed while conducting a traffic stop on I-84 in Southington back in May. He is the 26th state trooper to die in the line of duty since 2003. It is now day five of the investigation into the assassination attempt of former President Donald Trump. Law enforcement is building a timeline now of the events at the rally, piecing together all of the facts and the evidence. Fox's Brian Yenis reports. Exclusive new video showing another angle of the chaos that unfolded after the shots rang out at former President Trump's rally in Pennsylvania on Saturday. Like it shows a police car ramming a fence, apparently in an attempt to gain access to the building the shooter Thomas Matthew Crooks was on top of. The FBI now focusing on Crooks' movements leading up to the attack. He went to a shooting range the day before the rally, where he practiced firing. The morning of the shooting, he bought 50 rounds of ammo from a local gun shop and a ladder from Home Depot. Fox News has learned Crooks' parents were calling law enforcement the day of the rally, worried and looking for their son. Even though the shooter is dead, there are answers that need that still remain is was there any support? Was he consuming hate speech? Were there any witting or unwitting co-conspirators? I don't think that there are, but we still have a long way to go in this investigation. Government sources have told Fox News about a possible Iranian plot to assassinate the former president that stemmed from his 2020 order to take out an Iranian general. Meanwhile, Americans shaken after watching a former president escape an assassination by inches have flooded gun stores to make purchases. Business significantly picked up Sunday morning, all day Sunday. We've seen a 40 to 50 percent increase in business nearly overnight. The shooter's parents are cooperating with authorities as the FBI tries to determine a motive for the attack. In New York, Brian Yenis, 
Fox News. And coming up at 6.30, Fox 61's Matt Karen speaks with Quinnipiac University students who were actually at the rally on Saturday. They share their first-hand accounts of those frightening moments.